Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming here tonight. We're delighted to have each of you here for what we know will be a very informative talk. I want to mention that we're always grateful to the Southampton Hospital, with whom we partner frequently for their wonderful resources of physicians and various different medical personnel. Uh, coming up next month, we have a program about hand therapy, and we have a flyer for it on the desk, and we hope that those of you who are interested will be here. Um, I also want to thank the woman who we coordinate with at Stony Brook Southampton, who just does a great job uh, making these things available to us and then seeing through uh, all the details, and that's Karen Wolfrath. Karen, thank you. <laughs> and I want to mention that Karen has just uh, had a promotion, and she is now the Director of Community Outreach. She is also the Administrative Director of the Regional Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center. So, a good, a, uh, a wonderful person to know and, and wonderful to work with. Uh, we are very grateful to the physician uh, who is here to speak to us, whose name is Max Minerat, standing over there, cannot miss him. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Uh, Dr. Minerat grew up in New York and attended Colorado College in Colorado Springs. In 2005, he graduated from medical school at Stony Brook University School of Medicine and completed his residency in emergency medicine at Stony Brook University Hospital, where he was the chief resident. Dr. Minerab is board certified in emergency medicine and has worked in Southampton Hospital's emergency department for the last nine years. In addition to seeing patients in the ER, he also serves as the medical director for the local EMS agencies in Southampton, East Quag, Hampton Bays, and East Hampton. He is also the Southampton Hospital's representative to and chairman of the Suffolk County Regional Emergency Medical Advisory Committee. We're very fortunate to have him here as, and he is an active member of the medical panel of the Tick-Borne Disease Resource uh, Source Center at the Southampton Hospital. We very much appreciate his having taken time for, uh, for, for being here from a, a, a very busy schedule. Please welcome Dr. Dr. Max Monroe. So you'd like me to be here so it's mic for the So, thank you everybody for coming. I hope that you find this informative. Um, you know, we've, because we have a recording and we'd like for this to go you know, smoothly over the time period, we'd like to just hold questions till the end. We also appreciate it with questions if they're not so much about your own personal medical problems, just for the uh, everybody else in the room. So, so we have three you know, types of ticks primarily in our area that spread disease. Um, we have the, uh, the deer tick or the black-legged tick. We have the lone star tick or something called the white dot tick. And then the classic tick that everyone grew up with, the American dog tick. You know, it's important to note that everyone thinks oh, the little ticks are deer ticks and the big ticks are dog ticks. But you have to realize that all these ticks come in you know, three different sizes. The nymphal size, which are baby ticks, when they're just born, you know, or sort of larval ticks, which are the ticks that are just born, nymphs, which are sort of the, you know, the teenagers, and then adult, you know, size ticks. So not every little tick is a deer tick, not every big tick is a dog tick. So the life cycle of ticks, basically in the spring, eggs are born, those eggs hatch, they become larvae, the larvae go and get their, their first blood meal. Ticks really only feed, you know, two times in their life. They, or, they, they feed when they are larvae to become nymphs, and then from nymphs to become adults. And then the adult females feed again in order to, to lay eggs. Um, that first meal typically comes from rodents or birds, because you know, we're talking about an almost grain of sand size tick, you know. Um, 
and that's typically where they become infected. You know, the it's the white uh, white pointed deer mouse and the birds and the small rodents that are what we call the reservoir of these tick-borne infections. Um, and during that stage, they uh, you know they get it, there's a, a good chance of them becoming infected. And then when they feed again as nymphs, they, if they've been infected, they can then transmit that disease to us as an accidental host, or to deer or other larger animals. And then again, when they feed as an adult, they have a chance of transmitting that disease. While nymphal ticks have less burden of infection in them, you know, um, they're the ones that primarily spread disease because they're still very small. A nymph deer tick is about the size of a poppy seed and much easier to miss. Whereas if you have an adult tick, you know, more the size of a sesame seed on you, chances are you're going to find it before it's had a chance to spread anything. Okay. So, does this advance too, or? It, the, arrow. The, the arrow on them. That's just the pointer. Okay, yeah. So you're, you're walking down a path in the woods or to the beach and the tall grasses are kind of lapping down into the path and you know, you brush up against one, and there's a tick there, they call it questing, basically, you know, sitting there with its legs out, you know, or, you know, pincers out, waiting for you to walk by, or anything to walk by and grab onto you. And, you know, their ticks are pretty good at getting a meal. So this tick will climb onto you, climb up to a, a part of your body that it wants to, to feed on, they love behind your knees and the groin, but basically wherever they meet resistance and find what seems to be a cozy place, they're going to, you know, take their, what they, we call their hyposome, which is the feeding apparatus right there, and it's kind of barbed. They are going to make a little nick into you with that, put some anesthetic in there so you don't really feel them so much, bury the barb into you, and then cement it into place. Now, and then they're going to hang on to you until they, you know, had a full blood meal, which, you know, can be, you know, upwards of a week if you don't find them, you know. Um, People always come into the hospital with like a mark on them saying, I think a tick was there. I, you know, like, if you didn't take it off, chances are there was no tick there. People, ticks don't tend to leave a bite and leave. They, they finally found something to eat. They've been waiting for this, you know, their whole life. And they're going to stay on until they've completely engorged themselves and gotten enough blood to move on to the next stage of their life. Okay, so. I go twice once? No. Okay. So, well, as we go through the talk, I'll talk about the different ticks that we have and then the diseases that they, uh, they spread. So, we have the, the black-legged tick, which we said was the deer tick. You can see for scale size, you know, a adult and a nymph size tick. Larval ticks, you really don't have to worry about. Larval ticks are born sterile, is the, the, is the thought, you know, um, and they have to get infected by a blood needle. So if you're bit by a larval tick, which you probably won't even know you were bit by, you know, you're not going to really be contracting any illness from that tick. Um, the Lyme, the, the deer tick spreads, you know, it's the vector of what we call of Lyme disease, of an infection called Babesia, an infection called Anaplasma, and what's been getting more pressed recently, the, uh, the Quassin virus. As we said earlier, it's usually spread by the, the nymphal form because they're, they're the smaller side of that. That's the nymph, and that's the an adult. So here's some very good images of the ticks. This is from a website called TickEncounter.org. It's out of University of Rhode Island. They have, you know, a very lots of very good reputable information because as you look around, there's lots of not so reputable information on the internet about Lyme disease and ticks. Um, but as well, they also have very good images to help you identify the ticks because if you once you can identify the tick, you can really know what you're at risk. For. You know, if you're bitten by a dog tick, you don't need to worry about Lyme disease. Everyone, you know, you know, thinks a tick is a tick is a tick. So going and, and looking and identifying what the tick is and knowing what to worry about is, is you know, a big part of the battle here. So you know, this shows you the adult female, adult male, nymph size, and then larval size ticks. You'll notice three legs on a larval and four legs on a, uh, a nymph and adult. That's the way that separate. But again, great grain of sand poppy seed, sesame seed, you know, so not so easy to see too. So Lyme disease is you know, it's the most common tick-borne illness in the U.S. and we're seeing 
lots and lots more Lyme disease being reported, whether that's truly increase in incidence or increase in awareness, testing, thus showing a huge increase in incidence is always hard to tell, but in general it's becoming more and more prevalent and more and more people are worried about it. Um, it's spread by a bacteria called Borrelia moldurferi, which is a spiral-shaped bacteria. Um, it's at the primary reservoir, so where the disease exists in the, in the wild to be contracted by the ticks is the white-footed uh, mouse. And you know, basically, if you're depending upon you know, your exposure, it's all about exposure, basically, is you know, putting risk factors. So where you live, you know, on the eastern end of Long Island is a not so great place for these things. Um, what you do, you know, are you outside exposing yourself? And uh, you know, that comes down to your activities, you know, your recreation, as well as your, your occupation. So this is a picture of the actual bacteria. It's um, under something called dark field microscopy here. You're never going to have a blood sample that you like. When you collect your blood sample and send it off to the lab, they're not looking at it for this. This is you know, isolated in the lab in a different way. But this gives you, you know, just an idea of the shape of the bacteria and how it likes to basically bore itself into our nervous system, you know, being this spiral-shaped bacteria that's built around. So, Lyme disease comes in, in, in three different stages. It's you know, very much like syphilis, which is also a spirochete-shaped organism. Um, you have this early localized infection, which occurs somewhere in the first few days to a month, but typically one week to two weeks after you've been infected by the tick. You know, they, it's like the tick has to be on you for at least 24 hours, but probably more like 48 to 72 hours to really transmit the infection because the infection lives in the gut of the tick. The tick has to feed on you and you know, sort of regurgitate a bit you know, for it to put anything into you uh, as far as infection is concerned. So when you get that tick off you that you notice just that day and you pull it right off, you know, your risk of, of getting Lyme disease from that tick bite is pretty close to zero. You know, if, especially if you notice the tick is not engorged with blood at all. Okay, but, um, the, the classic early Lyme disease is that, you know, that everyone sees and thinks about is this classic rash, you know, the bullseye rash. Um, that's a sign that you've been infected with Lyme if you develop this rash in an area where you were bit by a tick. You, know, you may not have noticed the tick, though you might have scratched it off, or again, maybe it was on you for long enough for you to not <clears throat> see it at all, you know, for it to have fed and dropped. Um, but, you know, in some ways, you're lucky if you get that rash, right? You know, some people would say, oh my god, I've been infected by Lyme, but you're, you're one of the people who knows you were infected by Lyme, right? So now you can get treated right away early, and it most likely have no complications come from that, you know, exposure to Lyme. So, unfortunately, less than 50% of people get the classic bullseye rash from a tick bite. It's more common in children um, to have the classic rash than adults, but it's still not, you know, Someone maybe they say maybe even about 30% or so of people actually get a classic rash. Um, <laughs> during that initial period, you might get some mild constitutional symptoms. What we mean by constitutional symptoms are that I've got a you know, fever, a little bit of body aches, a little bit of joint pain, a mild headache, but it's not a severe illness. It probably wouldn't make you come to an emergency department. You might blow it off because it goes away over several days and never see your doctor and thought I just had like a fluey thing that I picked up in the summertime. Um, so, if, so if you miss the, well, okay, there's some other pictures of the rash, you can see just some variable appearances. But, you know, this here is a classic one that confuses people. And they think they have a, a cellulitis, a skin infection behind their knee. But it's not a common place to get a skin infection. And it's a very common place to get a tick bite. So if you see a big red rash in the back of your knee, that's something to think about. It's not the classic bullseye, but, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's one of the more common ones we see. So, um, as you move into secondary Lyme or early disseminated Lyme, we start, which is you know, somewhere in several weeks to months after the, the exposure, you can develop what we call multiple erythema migraines, which is the rash starts popping up in different spots in your body. I mean, this could be someone who was unlucky a bit by a bunch of ticks, right? But most likely, it's a, a sign of the, you know, a cutaneous, a skin sign of the Lyme disease coming out later in the infection. Um, people 
you know, develop a more severe flu-like illness where they really feel, you know, pretty bad body aches and headaches, and now it's a good chance you maybe show up to your doctor with these symptoms. People can develop meningitis at this stage, which is, which is an infection of the meninges of the brain, which is the lining of the brain. You know, that's going to present with a very bad headache, high fevers, neck stiffness, sensitivity to light, maybe vomiting. <clears throat> Some people develop a facial nerve palsy, um, where half the face stops working. The sign that's not a stroke is it involves the forehead, so the forehead doesn't work, the eye doesn't want to close properly, you really can't move that side of the face. You probably will have decreased taste on the tongue on that side, and have it be preceded by pain right behind your ear, which is where the nerve is normally getting inflamed coming out of the brain, the facial nerve that goes out to innervate that whole side of the face, and you know, the, the Lyme disease is making the nerve dysfunction. In most of, you know, we call that sometimes Bell's palsy. By, by definition, Bell's palsy is a, lot, is a facial nerve palsy that we don't know what it's caused by, it's called idiopathic, you know, we're idiots, and we don't know what <laughs> caused it, but in, in our area, Lyme is a common cause, and the most common cause worldwide of it is a, is a herpes infection. So if you get cold sores, which is a type of a herpes, and then you get a facial droop, <laughs> we'd want to treat you for both Lyme disease and herpes at the same time or tissue developments. Now, it classically was thought that the facial nerve palsy is a sign of peripheral Lyme disease, not meningitis with Lyme disease or Lyme disease in your central nervous system. And <clears throat> there's a big divergence in treatment between peripheral Lyme disease and central nervous system Lyme disease. In you know, peripheral Lyme disease, you get your doxycycline or a, a similar oral antibiotic uh, that covers Lyme that you take for you know, somewhere between 10 days and four weeks, depending on you know, not a lot of good evidence. Um, and the, if you have sexual nervous system Lyme disease, you're on a intravenous antibiotic for a month or you know, 28 days <coughs> treating that. So, there are people who believe that if you develop this facial nerve and you test positive for Lyme, especially if you have some constitutional symptoms with it, some fever, some headaches, not feeling so great, you should have a spinal tap to look for meningitis, you know, Lyme meningitis, because likely we would partially treat you with doxycycline and then it would come back and give you, you know, many, you know problems from a, a cognition point of view. You would never have truly cleared it from your central nervous system. <coughs> So late Lyme, so this is what we call chronic Lyme disease, and you know, I, I, chronic Lyme disease, me as an ER doctor, it's not something I specialize in at all. You know, I mean, there's lots of different treatments for chronic Lyme disease. Um, you're more so at this stage not dealing with an actual acute infection, but the damage that that infection has done. And so there, the, there's many, many complementary medical treatments that may or may not work, and what's most important is really that the patient is feeling better from what they're doing at that point. But, Late infections that will often develop are Lyme arthritis, which is a big swollen joint. That's something that, it's normally one joint, we call it Montauk knee, where it's, it's a not that red, big swollen boggy knee. Lyme, if it's gonna truly infect a joint, it tends to affect one joint. But when you're acutely sick with Lyme, you sort of have a myalgias, you know, joint pain all over your body. But that doesn't mean you have Lyme arthritis. Lyme arthritis is just the one joint being infected. That is, you know, used to, we used to say oral antibiotics were good enough. We, we tend to treat that with IV antibiotics now. <clears throat> um, cognitive dysfunction is, is a very difficult thing to blame on Lyme, but if you've had Lyme meningitis, any meningitis can cause cognitive dysfunction down the rest of your life. But very difficult to separate and very important that you have a full workup for the cognitive dysfunction and not blame it on the Lyme disease when there's no way anyone can really prove that it is the Lyme disease that did that, except by ruling out all the other causes of, you know, brain fog, dementia, what have you. There's nothing worse than having gone down a long treatment for Lyme disease to find out you have multiple sclerosis, you know. Um, so, how do we diagnose Lyme? It, it, the one, the diagnosing Lyme is, is very challenging. So if you have the, the, the rash, we don't need to do anything at that point. You know, patients always want blood work to get the rash. No, you don't need blood work, you have Lyme disease. Here's your antibiotics, let's treat it. 
because chances are at the stage the rash pops up, you're not going to have any antibodies in your system yet. We, we look for Lyme not by looking for the bacteria itself for the most part. Um, we do that, that a little bit now, and there's probably a, a short window during the early infection where the Lyme is still really in the bloodstream before it's gone and made a home in your nervous <laughs> system um, or in your tissues elsewhere where we can't really find it that well. Um, there's you know, a little period in the first week where we call, we call PCR testing, which is where we actually look for the DNA of the spirochete bacteria in the bloodstream. Um, you know, we have a little window there for that, but most of what we do is what we call serologic testing or antibody testing, which is where we're looking for your immune system's response to Lyme disease. Um, and it takes a while for your immune system to respond to Lyme disease. And if you're, fully, if you're treated early, you may never really respond with a big immune response. So it, it gets very tricky, but you know, if in the first few weeks of illness, the testing is only gonna be positive, you know, 30% of the time in people who develop Lyme disease. So we have a lot of work to do on getting better testing for Lyme. But the main thing is to do follow-up testing. So you would do your, your tests now, you know, when you're worried in the beginning, and then six weeks later, you get tested again to see if you've had a change in your antibodies. Um, so, treatment, as we said, you know, somewhere between 10 and 28 days of doxycycline is the first line treatment, as, and there isn't really, the CDC says 10 is fine, some people do 14, some do 21, some do 28, I pick 21 because it's in the middle. And it's not, honestly, there's not a lot of science to whether 21 works better than 28 versus 14. And the reality is I picked 21 because I know most people will at least take 10 days if I give them 21. Because it's, it's not an easy antibiotic to take. You know, it's hard on the stomach, it, you know, it gets, you get badly sunburned, most of the time it's the summertime. You know, no one wants to take this, this medicine that makes them feel not so good. So, at least 10 days though, okay? Um, we don't use doxycycline in pregnant people or children under the age of eight uh, for Lyme disease. Um, there are cases where we still will give them this test if they need it, but it's, you know, it, it causes a bottling of the teeth, you know, it makes bones yellow, teeth yellow, and no one wants their, you know, baby to come out when their primary tooth pop out with big black spots all over them and whatnot, so we don't like to do that. Um, for children under eight, we typically use amoxicillin as the first line treatment, um, and then we can use, you know, in, in adults who are allergic to doxycycline, we can use amoxicillin or what's called a cephalosporin, which is a, you know, antibiotic that will also treat Lyme. It's what the IV antibiotic is, but it's like the out. So as you go into, as I said, if you go into the more complicated parts of Lyme disease, you know, we, we tend to use, you know, IV antibiotics. So Lyme arthritis, you could do an oral course, but, you know, typically in our community, we see people going on the IV course for 28 days of, of, of ceftriaxone or rosefin, which is its brand name. Um, for the facial paralysis, you know, if you're test Lyme negative, being on the doxy is reasonable. If you test Lyme positive, again, and then you have a positive spinal tap, you would need to be on the IV antibiotics. And then for heart symptoms, which I didn't really get into, but you know, the Lyme likes to attack the, the nerves in the heart as well, and it can cause you to have what we call heart block, which is where the top half and the bottom half of the heart don't talk to each other, and your heart goes very slow. Um, it can cause an effusion around the heart, which is a, a fluid collection between the heart and the sac that surrounds the heart. You know, none of them are things that you want to happen. Anytime you see things like that happen to, especially young people in the summer out here, where you wouldn't expect a young person to develop, you know, a heart block, you have to think about Lyme, and you tend to presumptively treat for Lyme disease without knowing, you know, any cultural results or anything at that point. You know, or any, any problem. PCR testing, because most of that testing takes about four or five days to come back, and you have to decide, are we gonna treat people acutely and see what the testing shows, or see what the testing shows and then treat people? So, okay. So, out of Lyme disease and into Nebesia, so for me as an ER doctor, Lyme disease is interesting, but it's not exciting. You know, it's, you know, if you get a heart block from Lyme or meningitis from Lyme, you know, there's something where I'm making a big difference in your day, but, you know, if you showed up to me with the rash, you know, my administrator's really happy. He gets to bill your insurance a lot of money to come to the ER to be seen for a rash, you know, but you could have probably waited and seen your doctor the next day and had no difference in your outcome, whether you were in the ER for that or whether you were in a clinic the next day. 
if you have something like the disiosis, that's something that we, you know, and anaplasma, the other we get into. Those are things where if we make the wrong decisions on your first time coming in, we may not get a second time, you know, to make the right decision. So I find for me this is much more exciting, much more interesting, if people were much acutely sicker. So Babesia, um, we call it the you know, island fever is another name for it, or Montauk malaria. It's in, endemic in you know our area, the eastern seaboard of you know of uh, the northeast. Um, it's carried by the deer tick, just like Lyme is, and you can get both at the same time. You know, um, its incubation period tends to be from one to two weeks, and most of the time we make this diagnosis in July and August. So it's the nymph ticks that we're feeding in the springtime and you know in June that transmit this. To us, and then we we get sick in July. So, um, so basically, you know, it looks like this is not something that you're going to wonder if you have. You know, it's like I've been hit by a truck. I've not been this sick in God knows how long. I have a horrible flu in July, and I'm not coughing, and I don't know why. You know, um, it's it's like malaria in that it's a you know, parasitic infection that goes and invades our red blood cells. So you get bit by the tick and then the you know, bacteria goes and it goes and lives inside. It goes and makes a home inside your red blood cell. <clears throat> it multiplies inside your red blood cell and then eventually causes the red blood cell to burst, which lets out all kinds of inflammatory markers into your bloodstream and causes you to feel very sick. And then now you have a whole bunch more of them and they go and find more blood cells and the, the cycle continues. Um, it's, it's much more serious, like all these diseases, and this, that, this pops up a few times, I won't say it for another one, but in newborns, elderly, people who don't have a spleen, you know, there, anytime you have an immune system issue, you have much more of an issue with an infection like this. I mean, if you're sick enough to be hospitalized for Babesia, because we can treat it with oral antibiotics, there's a six and a half percent chance you're not gonna make it through that hospitalization, you know, so. It's a, it's a much more serious illness than Lyme, or acutely a much more serious illness than Lyme. But there are also a lot of people, if you look at, if you look at the you know, blood samples from people who live on Shelter Island, many of them have antibodies against Babesia and never knew they had Babesia. You know, they, as a you know, teenager, got sick in the summertime before we knew about all these things. Their immune system took care of it, beat it, and they're fine. But when you end up really sick from it, you, you start to get in trouble. Um, so the main thing for us is, as docs is it's basically if you see a patient who has a new anemia with a fever and a flu-like syndrome in the middle of summer, you have to start thinking about something like Babesia. Um, we diagnose it, basically we do blood work. Um, you tend to have a low white blood cell count. You're always gonna have a low red blood cell count because those are the ones that are getting burst. And oftentimes your platelet counts are down as well. Um, so all of the, the blood counts are, are suppressed. Your liver function tests go up a little bit, and you know, as, as long as you have a, a fair number of them in your system, we, when we do a smear of your blood, which is basically they take the blood and look at it on a slide, we'll see red blood cells that have the parasite in them. And unless you just came back from Africa or Costa Rica or somewhere where malaria is common, we're going to make a diagnosis of Babesia here and get you started on, on appropriate medication. Um, we do a PCR test also, which is the DNA test to look for. It's a very, it's a very sensitive test for this because um, there's again there's a good load in the bloodstream to look for. But that's going to take several days to get back. You know, all of these Lyme tests and all these things get sent off to a lab in Lyme, Connecticut, which is where they discovered Lyme disease. It's where Imogen is, which is the lab the hospital uses. But it's a five to seven day turnaround period. So you you can't really wait for five to seven days to treat these illnesses. You have to start with treatment. But we're, we'll be pretty sure that you have it. Um, so depend, the treatment options basically, so we use something called atovacone, or which is metron or azithromycin. Those are both oral antibiotics. The atovacone is this yellow liquid, and azithromycin is the Z-pack that everybody knows from you know, treating your sinusitis, you know, what have you. Um, you can also use clindamycin quinine, which is more of a classic malaria treatment. Um, and then if you have a, a low basis, so when we look at the red blood cells on that slide, we see how many of them are infected. And if more than 10% or so are infected, or you fit into one of those categories of people with a really bad immune system, you don't have a spleen, for example, we will consider transferring you to a large medical center where they can do what's called an exchange transfusion, which is where they actually 
you know, your blood comes out and new blood goes in. And that reduces the load of parasite dramatically um, so that you don't uh, end up, you know, because it's the bursting of the cells. And once we start treating you, you often get more it before you get better because we're killing these bacteria. They're dying in the cell. The cells are still bursting and the inflammatory process continues. So by taking that out, if you have a high load, we increase the chance that you can do it. I, you know, of all the people I've transferred over to Sony Brook to do this, I think you know only a, a small percentage of them do they actually ever end up having to do it. You know, they tend to ponder them, treat them, see how they're doing, and then end up deciding to not do it because they get better. So, anaplasma is another infection, and it's very much like babesia, but instead of infecting the red blood cell, it infects the white blood cell. For all these things, this is all about the same. 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 You get, you know, one or two weeks after you get bit is when you get sick. Um, you know, it basically, you know, high, high fever in the summertime and body aches and, you know, generalized illness. We're going to see the same general markers in the bloodstream of being low because you're bursting white blood cells this time. You're almost always going to see the low white blood cell count. Your red blood cell count should be normal to help separate from babesia. And then if we're lucky on a smear, they might see one of these. But you, know, you have you know, thousands of red blood cells for every, or hundreds, there's hundreds of every red blood cell for each white blood cell. So the chance of them finding this on the smear for you is relatively low to make a diagnosis. Okay. Um, the blood tests are often positive quickly, but we don't wait for them to come back. We start to the doxycycline is the treatment of choice for this. So one of the nice things about all these tick-borne illnesses is except for the babesia, which you have to treat with, you know, the mepron and the uh, azithromycin, um, you, they, all the others are treated with doxycycline. So whether you have anaplasma or, you know, Lyme or, as we get into other ones, or lichia, what have you, doxycycline is the treatment. So, you know, we don't have to, it's not like we have to figure out exactly what you have then, we just have to suspect you have a tick-borne illness and then get you on treatment as quickly as possible. So, um, Poisson virus is, yeah, you know, as I said, it's, it's, there's a lot of press about it, a lot of fear about it. Anytime we have a viral illness that we can't treat, everyone gets scared. But, you know, getting cross and virus is like, you know, winning the lottery. You know, you're not going to get it. I mean, there's a 1%, or not, what, we had one case in the past, you know, couple of years. I mean, it's, it's really, really, really rare. Um, you know, when they did surveys of ticks to see what percent had quassin in them, it was extremely low. So, you know, while we, I think we had one case in Suffolk County, overall the, the chance of you getting this compared to Lyme or Antipyrus or the is extremely rare. Um, when the, the things about that are different are that, you know, because a viral illness like this is more like a mosquito-borne illness, that's where we think of West Nile, it's very similar to West Nile, um, it only takes seconds to transmit. So if the tick bites you, you the virus, because they're so much smaller than bacteria, can get into you right away. Imagine how long the mosquito is on you to transmit an illness. You know? um, the, uh, it causes an encephalitis, which is going to be basically a bad headache. It's an infection of the brain tissue itself. Um, the symptoms are going to be fevers, chills, bad headache, confusion. We would, you know, anyone who presents with that type of syndrome for ER is going to get a spinal tap. And, you know, you'll see white blood cells there and we'll treat you for bacterial meningitis so we can prove it is. But there is no specific treatment for any of these viral encephalitis except good supportive care. So hydration, treat the fever, take good care of the person's body so that their body can fight the infection. Okay. So we're on to the, so out of the deer tick and onto the Lone Star tick. Uh, Lone Star tick has been increasing dramatically in our area over the past, you know, day. Um, it used to be primarily a tick born in the southeastern United States, and it's been, you know, coming up the, uh, the corridor to here, and uh, you know, following, you know, following <coughs> deer, animals, and climate. You know, so everyone can pretty much recognize the adult female Lone Star tick because it's got the big lone star on its back. Um, a lot harder to separate these guys from a deer tick uh, unless you get you know, pretty good at looking at ticks. Um, the main infection that the lone star tick spreads is something called Ehrlichia. 
It's very much like anaplasma, except it infects a different white blood cell. Um, and otherwise, you know, basically all the blood work, all those other things are going to be exactly the same as anaplasma, and we're going to treat you with doxycycline. Um, just a little picture of the life cycle, same idea. You know, this is a white blood cell in your body. What, what, what a lot of white blood cells in the body do is they, they go around and they gobble up bacteria, right? That's their job. They're clearing the bacteria out of your system. But then the, the ehrlichia, you know, replicates inside the white blood cell and then eventually causes that white blood cell to burst. You know, inflammatory markers come out, more ehrlichia in your system, more white blood cells get infected, the negative feedback loop continues, you know. Uh, so, same thing, 7 to 14 days, same clinical picture, you know, pretty high hospitalization rate, you know, 60% of people with this that we diagnose with this and are sick enough to come to a hospital or end up being sick enough to stay in the hospital, and somewhere between a 2 and 5% mortality rate. So, um, again, you want to make sure to make this diagnosis for me. So, that's pretty much it. Okay. The other thing that the, the Lone Star Tick can do is, is transmit something called Alpha Gal, which is a meat allergy. Um, it's a, an allergy to pretty much, you know, all mammal meat. Um, and it doesn't just have to be meat, but gelatins and other things that come or derive from a mammal um, can, you know, can cause a reaction. It's no reaction to one of the, you know, the sugars within the, you know, within the, the animal's you know, body, basically, that you're eating. But you get sensitized by a bite from the lone star tick. And then, normally somewhere 48 hours after you eat the meat, you end up having an anaphylactic type or allergic type reaction to the meat. They called it midnight anaphylaxis for a while, because it tended to be you know, you're at your hamburger for dinner, and you woke up at 2 in the morning with you know, all bright red within your throat swelling and wondering what's happening. And it's, you know, emergently, it's treated like any other allergic reaction. We give you your, your epinephrine, we give you your Benadryl, we give you fluids. You know, most people recover pretty quickly and are on steroids for a little while. But figuring out that this is what it is is what's tricky. You know, um, the local expert on this is a woman named Erin McGinty. You know, just because this is such a common entity in our area compared to most of the U.S., she's become like a national lecturer on it and a researcher, and um, we're lucky to have her kind of here. She's lucky to have been here, right, to get to do this, and um, we're lucky to have her. But she's who we tend to refer people uh, to. If end up having this type of infection. No, not infection, but an allergy, I should say. The other thing to know about lone star ticks versus deer ticks is lone star ticks are much more aggressive. You know, lone star ticks, well, they, they smell CO2 that comes out of us, or carbon dioxide as we breathe, and they search for that. You know, they'll travel miles to a scent to feed, you know, whereas a deer tick pretty much spends its whole life climbing up and down a blade of grass hoping we walk by, you know. So, um, it's they're much more aggressive in taking. I would say, you know, just my very non-scientific study of what's on my dog is, you know, sixty percent lone star ticks and forty percent deer ticks. You know, just because I think they are always looking for somebody. You know, so we <coughs> see a lot more of this, you know, deer, of this uh, lone star tick on people in general. But most people catch them quickly because they are big, quite a bit bigger in general than a, uh, a deer tick. You know, people tend to notice that they have something that size on it. So chigger bites, right? You know, everyone I always there was like, oh yeah, chigger, chigger. So supposedly we have no chiggers on Long Island. Okay? So basically, and this is too much typing here. Um, but you know, Scott Campbell, who was the you know, director of the Arthropod Center of Suffolk County, and whatnot, you know, has searched and searched and they've never found a chigger. You know. These are all supposedly lone star larval tick bites. You know, so you walk into a nest of larval ticks in the summer and you get, you know, all bitten up. <clears throat> they can't transmit the infection to you. They can just give you the safety cheap bump. It doesn't matter if it's a chigger or, or a tick bite and cheap bump. Not really. You're going to treat it the same way with some, you know, topical steroid and take Benadryl and try not to, and us, you come in and complain and we'll tell you to try not to scratch you. There's not too much we can do. Uh, but, you can develop the alpha-gal allergy from a larval tick bite because it's not a bacteria spread by the tick. It's a sensitization from the tick. So that's the, the main difference there. So 
Now basically I go into some parts of this talk where it's like the what do we do myth. And you know, as opposed to the you know, more clinical, academic you know, thing as, as far as whatever you take has. So I found a take on me. What do I do? You know, everyone call the emergency department immediately, right? I can, this happens all the time. Um, but you want to remove the tick, right? You know, the longer the tick is on you, the more the chance it has of spreading disease. So attempt to identify the tick and then seek treatment. Needs. So I, almost everyone nowadays has a smartphone in their pocket. Before you mangle this thing, try to take it out of you, take a picture of it, you know? A nice zoomed in picture. That way you can look at your picture and then look at other pictures and say, I had a this attached to me. And you, you, know, you may not be able to, but it's gonna be a lot easier than looking at this thing that you broke apart with a tweezer and trying to figure out what it is, you know? Um, remove the tick, we'll go over how to do that. You know, basically, and again, the sooner you remove it, the better. There's lots of old wives' tales about things to do with ticks that are horrible, right? You know, let me, you take a match to the back of the tick. That's a good idea. You know, you know <laughs> let's, let's burn myself and then piss off the tick so it spits everything into you. You know, you cover them and suffocate them in, you know, petroleum products and stuff like that. You know, now you've made a tick very slippery and hard to take off. And you've just left it on there. It's doing fine under the petroleum and it's feeding on you for like two more days while you stare at it getting infected. Um, I mean, ticks can live underwater. They've you know, put them in swimming pools and hot tubs and bags to see how well they last, and they last days. You know, they like humid environments. Ticks actually, what kills ticks is heat and dry. You know. um, so how do we take a tick off? I mean, this is the simplest way to take a tick off. In the, in, did, we, did we give out kits today, Karen? We're giving out kits to everyone as they do. Okay, so basically in the, in the kits you'll get, there's this pair of tweezers, basically. And it's a nice, pointy, very fine tip tweezer. You can definitely stab yourself with it by accident. It's very short. But it allows you to precisely grab the tick by the head and pull it out. Because that's really all you have to do, is grab the tick right by its head and lift it out of your body. You can give a little twist if you want. Some people think that helps. But overall, just pulling it out is, is key. And the closer the head you grab it, the better the chance that you get the whole tick out and not rip the body and the head apart. If you do rip the body and the head apart, you can try to get the head, but don't, you don't have to torture yourself. But the infections are all pretty much you know, up in the salivary glands, which sit behind the head and in the gut of the tick. And if you left the head behind, while most people really don't like that idea, it's not going to leave you with an infection because you did so. You know? But if you want to, you know, again, it can be cut out of you with you know, some anesthetic, or you can dig and dig with the tree. Um, and then if you do that with your child, they'll never let you take another tick off. <laughs> um, this is, there's a lot of commercial devices out there for removing ticks. Most of them are marketed for your pets, really, you know, but they, they work well just the same. You know, the ones that are more like, like a, a little thing with a groove in it don't work so well for deer ticks because their deer tick is too small. They're more for a dog tick or a horse tick. But this thing called a tick lasso is, is pretty good. I use it for kids to take ticks off often because ticks, kids don't like pointy tweezers and they're not typically afraid of a loop of fishing line. And so I can get that, the lasso around the tick and the kid stays still and we take them off versus you know trying to take a poppy seed off somebody who's bouncing around. Um, but it works very well. You basically put the little loop over the tick's head, tighten up the lasso, give a twist and pull the tick out. So tick identification, we sort of talked about this, but note the size of the tick, how many legs, is it engorged, what color it is, but you know, taking a photo of the tick and then going to somewhere like that Ticket Counter uh, website and looking at them, they have a program on there called Tick Spotters, which I think they just like you make a little donation to, where some entomologists will look at your picture of a tick that you post and tell you what they think it is. Uh, it's a good way to try to identify the tick. Uh, so testing the tick, right? Everyone, they come in with the tick in a bag. Can you test the tick? Does, it, does, does the tick have Lyme disease? And it's really not recommended to test the tick. Um, basically, you know, it will show if the tick has what, you know, different organisms in them. That's, you know, we will find out about that tick. It doesn't tell us much about you, you know? If, you know, you may have been, if the tick was infected and it bit you and you got it off early, chances are you didn't catch anything. So do you want to go on, 10 days of an antibiotic and you know suffer the complications just because we're bit by a tick that happened to be infected? You know, I wouldn't. Um, 
And just because the tick is negative doesn't mean you weren't hit by other ticks, and that's not why you're sick. So it really is a pretty unhelpful thing, you know, as far as clinically treating a patient. You know, there are places you can mail the tick yourself and get tested by if you're really curious, by all means, go ahead, but no one at the hospital is going to send your tick off to be tested for you. Okay. So when to seek medical attention. You couldn't remove the tick, right? It was either in a spot that you can't really see well or reach well and you don't have someone else you trust to do that for you. Um, if you have the rash and you don't have a, a primary care doctor you can go and see, you know, this one's kind of a no-brainer. You're sick, right? You know, that's when you really need to be in, in the worst environment. And then, you know, if you want a questionably necessary prophylactic dose of doxycycline. So there was one study that was done that showed that people who had an erythema migraine rash, or I'm sorry, people who had an engorged tick on them, so 48 to 72 hours, so they had this tick on them, and they pulled it off. If they were treated with a dose of doxycycline, a double dose, 200 milligrams, there was about a 50% less chance they contracted Lyme disease. It was not a big study, you know, and it's, you know, most of the time the people who are showing up and wanting to not have to take on them for all of, you know, several hours. You know, so I've talked myself you know, blue in the face about why they don't need the antibiotic and then still give it to them because that's why they're there and there's not really much harm in one dose of antibiotic, but I wouldn't, if you pull a tick off yourself that's not engorged, you know, I wouldn't, you know, go and incur the expense of seeing a physician just to get a dose of doxycycline. Now, if I take this full of blood and I take it off myself, maybe I would want to take that dose. You know, but just because I, especially because I pulled a lone star take off, which doesn't carry Lyme disease, that I'm still nervous about, you know, I would not. So, um, things to know about us, we talk about this a little bit, but it makes you very, very photosensitive. Um, you'll look like a lobster if you go out to the beach and lay out. I mean, it's, it's not the same as a sunburn. It's a chemical reaction that occurs under the skin, but it, it feels just the same as a horrible sunburn. And even people who don't get sunburned ever, you know, they've got a dark complexion, they can wear no sunscreen, they will get to have all their skin peel off because they went out in the sun while they were on that side. Because they're not immune to the chemical reaction under their skin. You know, they get to feel what I feel like. Um, so, you should not take it with um, you know, mineral supplements. You know, calcium, magnesium, things like this. It's not that you, you just don't want to take the, the medication at the same time you take those. They will bind to the antibiotic and kind of what they call it, chelate it and make it so your body doesn't really absorb it. You know, can you have a little bit of milk in your coffee in the morning and take your doxycycline? Yes, you're not going to you know, ruin the doxycycline. But should you sit down and you know have it with your Pasta Alfredo in the evening, probably not. Yeah. So, uh, I have a small, a red circle-like rash, okay, and it's where I was bit by a tick. So, if, if it's a small, firm, and itchy little bump, it's probably just an allergic reaction to the tick, like any other bump bite, okay. But if it's larger than two inches across and it shows up a few days to weeks after you pulled the tick off that spot, then it's much more likely the error of the mind. Um, you know, if it's there through the migraine rash, you want to see antibiotic treatment right away. For the itchy bump, you know, it would be the same as any other bump bite. You could put a little bit of, you know, calamine on there, some topical steroid, topical Benadryl, take a Benadryl, take Benadryl, that sort of thing. If it goes away quickly by taking Benadryl, that would be a sign that it's the allergic reaction, not, you know, the line. I almost never got something how to me. How do I get it? So people get this from their, their pets all the time, right? You know, especially people who sleep with their dogs. Um, or, you know, or outdoor cats. Uh, and we, we, we're very good about treating our cats, right? You know, for dogs, we put these collars on them and do all this stuff. But unless you get a, 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 what we call a kills on contact collar, which is a little more toxic to your animal, you know, but, um, or use a product that has, what we call, we call it kills on contact. It basically means as soon as the tick, really gets on the animal, it, it starts to, all, the, all of these things are neurotoxins that at the dose they're at in your animal don't really cause, shouldn't cause any noticeable neurologic dysfunction, but to an organism the size of a tick will paralyze the tick. 
Uh, most ticks that come off of an animal that have worms on them will, you know, even if they're alive, they're not really going to be able to feed on you because they're, you know, they've been injured by the nerve, the nerve agent. Um, but if you use a non-kills on contact worm, one that's just going to kill them once they've actually fed on the animal, been on it for a while, that tick will not really like where it is because it, it tells something is wrong, get off, and guess who it's going to get on. Yeah. So definitely be, be careful about sleeping with your pets. And if you do, make sure to really do a daily tick check and use some type of a product that's going to make it so the ticks that come off that dog or, or cat are not even hurt. So my dog brought ticks inside, and I can't find out how long they live. So she said, deer ticks are particularly sensitive to desiccation, which means drying out. Um, is anything less than 90 percent? This is why you know ticks basically. That's why they go up and down the blade of grass when they live in the bottom of the grass, where it's nice and humid. They brave the dry environment out of the end, questing for a meal, and then they climb back down to where it's nice and humid. Um, you know, an unfed nymph-sized tick is unlikely to survive 24 hours inside your home. You know, in the laundry hamper where it's kind of moister, two to three days. Um, this is why we say you should you know, dry your clothes when you come back from a, a, tick, a risky tick environment rather than wash them. You put them in the dryer on high heat, you're likely to kill all ticks that would be on your clothing. You know, rather than putting them in the washer and in the dryer, much less likely that you're going to kill them because you have much more humid dryer. Um, so, what can you do to protect yourself from ticks? You know, it's all about exposure. So, you can go with the best fashionable look of tucking your socks and your pants into your socks whenever you're, you know, out for a hike or you know somewhere else. You can you can put um, you know permethrin treatments, chemical treatments on your clothes, and there are places you can send your clothes to get impregnated with these things. And there's clothes that you can buy that have this in them already. Um, you know, and that's not, I'm not saying you should wear these clothes all the time, but to have a set that you use for gardening or to have a set that you use when you go on for your hikes is you know, a reasonable thing to do. You can treat your pets with you know, a chemical to try and you know, send some of those kills chemical ones. Probably the most important thing in here is do a daily tick check. Check yourself, check your partner, check your kids. You know, but every day make it part of a routine. You know, the great time to lose is when you're sitting on the toilet. You know, you're just sitting there. You know, you, your chances are your pants are down. And you can check your legs behind your knees, your groin, everywhere down there that you normally wouldn't spend much time looking at. But take the few minutes that you're sitting there and go over your body and make sure you don't have any ticks on you. Um, you can spray your property. And here's where you, know, you mostly just want to spray the perimeter of your property. Again, you know, deer ticks aren't going to live in the middle of a lawn. You know, it's too hot, too dry. They like the tall grass, the brush, the leaf litter areas like that. You know, you're exposing the whole property to a lot of chemicals to just spray everywhere really nilly. You want them, you know, doing kind of focus spray on your perimeter. That's what you're going to do. And I typically recommend using a actual toxic product, not a you know, organic product. If you're going to do this, then you may as well. If you're going to do, if you're going to spray, you may as well spray. You know, um, the cedar oil is not very effective in comparison to the chemicals and. Um, it still hurts all the other parts <laughs> just the same. So you're not really going to feel a good favor by using the same oil. You're probably not doing yourself a favor by spraying it you know, and, and getting more of a false sense of security. Um, they have something called rodent devices, which we'll show, um, which are tubes that are impregnated with, uh, with, gauze, with um, cotton that's been impregnated with methylene that you can put where the mice live and they bring it back to their nests and make their nests out of it. And then that kills the, dip, the larval ticks that get on the mice before they can become nymphs. You know, if you can get it around to all the mice, it's a great idea. You know, it's just you know, not the, not, you know, you can't necessarily make them use it to build their nests. Um, and then having fencing and landscaping that just decreases your exposure. Um, so, you know, we'll go through each of them more detail. But treating your clothes, basically. So, you know, spraying your shoes at the beginning of each month with a permethrin spray is a good thing you. You can buy a bottle of permethrin at, you know, on Amazon, at the hardware store, you know, your Walmart, what have you. Um, it's not a spray that's meant to go on the skin, but you can spray your own clothes and you can spray your shoes. So since all ticks climb up from the ground or below to get on you, you know, treating the shoes is a great way to deter them from getting on you, and you're not really exposing yourself too much. Um, you know, 
you can as we talked about sending your clothes off to be treated and um, so you can put your clothes in the dryer on high heat for 10 to 15 minutes when you come back you know for something <coughs> to try and kill the tanks uh, before you wash your clothes okay. um, another thing i like to, to do is uh, use, use a lint roller so if you come back you know when you come back from your height or what have you to get the ticks that are on your clothes off, you just roll yourself down, put the roller roller, and you'd be surprised what you, you come up with. So we talked about spraying the property. Basically, it should be the perimeter, and you know, it's probably the single, if you're a homebody especially, you know, the single most effective thing you can do to decrease the number of ticks you have on and your protection from the contact. But again, you have to realize you are killing, this is not a tick spray, this is a bug spray. Right, you know, it's killing all the bugs. And so depending on your conscience and how you feel about that, and you know, the insects, uh, the role of the ecosystem in general, you know, you kill all the insects, now the birds aren't there, now the day that You know, so in general, I think checking yourself is more important than spraying. If you're gonna do one of those two things, check yourself for ticks every day rather than spray your property. This is those tick tubes, you know, it's an ingenious idea. Um, you can make your own very easily. You know, you can take your toilet paper rolls and your, you know, paper towel rolls and buy a bunch of cotton and spray it down with the permethrin that you would spray on your shoes and put them out by your wood pile or by your rock wall or around the foundation of your home. This is where the ticks, the, the, the mice are likely to be living. And if you see one that gets empty, replace it. Chances are you'll, you'll put out 20 and three of them will get emptied and you know, 17 will be the same. Now move them to you know where they get emptied because they're gonna keep using them in that same area. Okay. Um, landscaping things basically, you know, deer fencing can help keep deer out. You know, everybody blames the deer and the deer and deer. You know, the deer can, are like a, a, a subway system for ticks, but the deer do not infect ticks, okay? Deer don't get Lyme disease. They clear Lyme out of their system very quickly, as well as other tick infections. Um, but they do provide a infected tick with a meal and a ride to your property. You know that's pretty much what they do. Um, so by you know keeping the deer out, you can decrease the number of ticks that are potentially on your property because they're not going to be falling off that deer that's infected or that's um, that's been with that host. Um, so if you can find a planting that the deer don't like, you could use that. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you want to keep, keep pathways and whatnot clear of the grasses and branches and brush, so that if you're walking on a walkway, you don't have to bump up against all kinds of stuff every time you take your garbage out. Um, you can put a mulch barrier or a wood chip barrier around shrubs or around the property to try. You know, they say ticks won't really a deer tick at least isn't going to ever cross a three foot thing of, of wood chips. You know, it's just too dry, too hot, it doesn't want to make that trip. Um, but, you know, if you have a pachysandra bed up to your lawn, that pachysandra bed, if you, if you drug a sheet through there, I guarantee you, that's how they kind of do tick checks on properties, is they'll take a white sheet and they just pull it along, and then they look at how many ticks are on the white sheet afterwards. You pull it through that pachysandra bed and you're going to come out with some ticks. You know, um, keep areas where the mice are going to be and all the animals are going to be in low traffic areas. So if you have a bird feeder, it's really nice to look at, but you know what else eats from your bird feeder, right? You know, the deer eating from your bird feeder, the, the rodents are eating from your bird feeder, everything is feeding there. So that's sort of a high animal traffic area, definitely an area where there are more likely to be, you know, ticks that have fallen off those animals and they need to be So we're into the conclusion. Um, so basically, Things to remember, all ticks come in three different sizes. Not all small ticks are deer ticks, right? So there's your poppy seed size tick on a, you know, glued to a bait, you know, so you can get a good idea of scale, okay? Remember, all ticks climb up, you know, they don't blow off a tree and land on your head and, you know, get to your, for that tick to be on your head, it climbed up your body to get onto your head. I mean, if you were bent over, sure, you know, but in general, they're gonna climb up your body to get to go up. Um, only deer ticks transmit Lyme disease. You know, we talked about the three kinds of ticks. If you have a lone star tick on you or a dog tick on you, we, you're, you're not going to get Lyme disease from that tick. You know, so don't worry about Lyme. Don't go and take a dose of doxycycline when you're not sick from it. Um, most infections require at least 24 hours, or probably 48 to 72 hours to be transmitted. Um, 
you know, ticks are active all year long. Everyone thinks about ticks in the summertime, but you know, I mean, there's a tick questing, and it's certainly not summer, right? You know, the adult gear tick that's trying to get its the female that's trying to get its uh, blood meal to lay eggs to you know, hatch in the spring is most active in, in October. You know, trying to feed. I mean, again, it's an adult-sized tick. You're more likely to see it, but it still means that it's that, you know, they're very active. Um, people always talk about, oh, we had a you know a snowy winter or a cold winter, and that's going to kill the ticks. Not so much. You know, the snowy winter just creates an insulated, protected ground barrier, so the birds aren't finding them and eating them, and the uh, it's actually warmer under the snow than it is when there's no snow, and if, you, if we look at a map of where Lyme disease is in America, there's a lot of Lyme disease in Michigan. And I guarantee you their winter, you know, their best day of winter is better than our worst day of winter. You know, so the ticks are not, you know, they're, they're, these are hardy, hardy creatures. They will survive, you know, the world much better than we ever will. And, you know, you're not killing them by having a, a snowy winter. Um, you might kill more deer with that cold winter, but um, the easiest and safest way to remove a tick is to find some pair of tweezers. Treating your clothes is a great way to protect yourself. Treating your property is an effective way to reduce your exposure. And with doing all these things, tick hormones is completely preventable. It's a much better disease to prevent than to treat. Okay? I mean, that's probably true of everything, but in general, with exposure like this, you can really, if you're smart about it, you can prevent yourself from getting anything. Even, and still go out and enjoy everything that we like to do and why we live here, you know. I can't tell you how many people have, you know, who won't let their kids play on a lawn or won't go for a hike anymore, don't want to go, you know, to the sunken dunes because they're all afraid of ticks. But if you just take a couple precautions and do a good tick check, you can really still do everything you want to do. Okay. So, any questions? Uh, <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave that up. <laughs> Ah. Okay. Yes. So, you have Lyme disease, mm -hmm. you treat it up with the doxycycline, yeah. and you're cured. Yeah. Lyme disease is only going to stay in your body. Well, the antibodies for the Lyme disease, because when we test for Lyme, we're testing for your immune response, right? So you should, for a very long time, have a positive blood test for Lyme. We, we test, there's, there's antibodies that we look at for, for I was exposed and antibodies that tell us I'm acutely responding to something. But the ones that say I was exposed should stay positive for a long time. And those get, the only thing that gets tricky about that is again, if you're treated early, you may not develop many of those chronic I was exposed antibodies. So if you have it and, and you're always testing positive for it, <laughs> You feel like you've got bit by a tick again. Yeah. Do you go on another dose? Well, what you, you would look to see how your antibody titers change, okay. right? So you have a baseline in you that's documented by your doctor, <clears throat> right? And if all of a sudden you get a big spike of IgM again, yes, that's a new acute infection. Your body should respond better to it, you know, faster to the infection itself than someone who's never been exposed. That's why you build that memory in your immune system to you know, going to fight something again, you know, we eventually forget a little bit, but, you know, overall we, whatever, yes, you would then need to be treated again. And it's not the infection that's still in you, it's your immune system still sees it. Yeah. Um, are, are we working on a vaccine for humans? Yes. I mean, Can you repeat the question? Are we working on a vaccine for humans for Lyme? Um, there has been more increased interest in this. There's um, you know, research at Stony Brook actually that's going into it. But the main answer is we're probably much, much further from a vaccine for Lyme commercially available than people would hope it would. Um, because it's, vaccines are about money, right? You know, for the most part. You know, I mean, public health plays part of a role into it. But when a company makes a vaccine, they want a vaccine that they can give to everybody, right? You know, and they want the government and everyone to get on board of giving the vaccine to everybody. Um, to only a very select people would be interested in the Lyme vaccine. I mean, we're seeing it spread. It's becoming more popular, more trendy. There's much more fear of Lyme. That's what will <coughs> drive this. But, you know, you compare the actual risk of getting Lyme to chickenpox, you know, or 
small, you know, what have you, you know, the chances are, you know, it's going to be a much longer than we think. Also, I mean, we had a vaccine for Lyme around for a while. It, was, it didn't work that well, and you had to get boosted, like, almost annually. You know, so it's a, you know, not so many people want to subscribe to something that doesn't work that great, and they have to get shots every year for it. You know, I mean, we do it with a flu shot because the flu kills so many people a year. But to do it, you know, for Lyme will be a push. But I, I'm sure that eventually we'll see it. You know. Yes. Lyme, I've never heard of Lyme actually being sexually transmitted. Um, you know, that, that, I, that I've never heard of. Human to human Lyme disease is not something that I have ever heard of. Um, you know, there, the viral encephalitis and things like that, you do hear of those occasionally being sexually transmitted. Um, the, so the, from that part, no. In general, no, right? I, nothing I've ever heard of, and I don't think you'd be at risk. Get to this, with Lyme, it's so, the reason you still have so much trouble diagnosing Lyme is and you know, finding those bacteria in your bloodstream is that they don't stay there long. You know, when we draw a tube in your blood, we'd be lucky if there was one spirochete in that tube, you know, to, that's what, to, to do the PCR, the DNA test on, right, you know. Um, so because they quickly go and hide, it's not easy to transmit it in a secretion or in blood, right, you know. Um, as far as the allergic to penicillin question, um, so doxycycline is not a penicillin, you know, so there's that. Um, and then we typically use, so for kids, the amoxicillin, but you can, people, most people who are allergic to penicillin are, you can, if you really need to use a penicillin, you can desensitize them to that allergy, you know, by giving doses of it in a controlled environment, and eventually you overwhelm the allergic reaction to penicillin. And we've done that with things like treating syphilis where you really don't have too many other choices and so we'll take in and we'll treat you for it. Um, we use the other, the rocephin or the ceftriaxone is what we call a third generation cephalosporin. So they're related to penicillins but there's only a couple percent cross reaction. So we would still, you know, if you came in and said I'm allergic to doxycycline and I'm allergic to penicillin and I have a bullseye rash, we would give you an oral equivalent of rocephin or that cetraxone, and there would only be a couple percent chance that you react to it. And if your reaction is just a rash, well, you know, it's just a rash. When someone says, my whole throat swells up and I die, that's, you know, that's what we get. Yes? Yeah, I, I know you've been talking predominantly about a few cases, but what about the development of the biofilms and so, the antibiotics? Um, yeah. So, yeah, so there's, there's a theory that things like, you know, these spirochetes in line, and it's been documented reasonably well out of uh, John Hopkins. There's a, uh, a, physician, a physician researcher there who is very interested in these biofilms, which is basically saying that you know, the bacteria in your body, they encase themselves in a film which, which protects them and gives them a home sort of forever in your body you know, isolated from your immune system and from the antibacterial agents that we can give you. And, you know, it's not something that a lot is known about now. It's sort of the, it's the edge of Lyme, that infectious disease research right now. Um, you can, you know, the best treatments we have for, you know, acute Lyme that is more serious is, you know, high dose IV antibiotics for 28 days. And the hope is that that would do its best to penetrate these things. and. You know, and treat them. But overall, it's not the, the biofilms is not something that is. It's it's only partly believed in the medical community at this point. You know, it's, it's still typically general medical community lags behind academic community by about ten years. You know, and or by scientific academic community, which is not a bad thing because probably three quarters of the things in the academic science world turn out to be complete garbage by the time those 10 years have passed. Um, you know, but there are times where some of it was, you know, we could have done a better job of getting on board with that sooner. And that's probably, you know, that's, the biofilms fall into that world, at least as far as clinical significance in treating.
Um, if you're if you have uh, IV and we have a treatment, do you have to be hospitalized? No, no, no. You can get a you can get a, what we call a pick. Normally, what happens is people get what's called a pick line put in, which is a a line, of, an IV that goes into the vein in the upper arm. A port. A port it's not a port because it's not a port would be I'm going to need stuff for a year. You know, I'm constantly getting I'm getting my cancer infusions through it, and it's an implanted thing under your skin because no one wants to because you can go swimming with a port. You can live your life with a port. You know, with a with a pick line in, you're limited in what you do because you got this thing sticking out of your arm that's attached to you for a month. But you also don't have to go get an IV put in every time, every day to get stuck again to give you an infusion, right? An IV may last three days. Most people, you know, take, keeping an IV in is tenuous. You know, they get knocked out all the time in life if we send you home with just an IV to come back to, to get your antibiotics. And with, with the IV drug world that's out there, hospitals aren't too excited about sending most people home with IVs. Not that you couldn't inject through your port or inject through your pick line, but it's still just the cultures. We we tend to not use them, and we don't like to have them in for more than three days at a time. So you would, no matter what, need ten IVs placed to get through a course of Rosefin for Lyme disease. You can do that. You can do that. But you can. Yeah, yeah, listen, that's just a matter of cost, right? So some insurances will pay to have a nurse come to your house and give you the antibiotic. Some people know insurance come to the ER every day for a month to get their antibiotic. You know, um, it's probably the most expensive way to do it, but it's the only way they're going to get it. It's you know, free. You know, to come and have it done. And also, um, if you have Lyme or something like that, you feel like I guess truck hit you. You know, you're really sick. But if you have something sort of mildly, not quite right, mm -hmm. is that probably something else, not a thing? It could no Lyme can be very insidious, you know. Um, you know, you know, the truck things are more like the other infections from the ticks that I talked about. You know, Lyme can be very sneaky, you know, and give you much more mild symptoms and develop to a later stage without being treated, and that's how you get in trouble. So, so if something was Lyme. Mm -hmm. It should, yeah, yeah, no, you should still, yeah, you should still retest positive if you've been re-exposed and your immune system responded. Yeah, I mean, these tests aren't perfect, right? But, you know, they're the best thing you've got right now. But then you know probably need to do something about it. Yes, if you have a new bump in your titers, you should probably go on a course of, probably oral antibiotic first. If it's just that you're mildly symptomatic, it would be going back on the doxycycline, not going on the IV antibiotic. So when you spray your shoes and your clothing, mm -hmm. and you wash, you're drying it and washing it, do you have to then reapply it? So for the shoes, most people don't dry and wash their shoes. Uh, so the shoes, it's, you know, to, to starting, the, the, what the, the, what's recommended is, you know, starting in, in April, the more high risk tick season is April through mm -hmm. end of October. Basically starting on April 1st, you spray your shoes, you know, and then each month thereafter you spray the shoes, you know, on the first month. Yeah, with, no, with, with permethrin spray. So DEET is, can go on your, your skin. Permethrin, you wouldn't want to put on your skin. Yeah, I mean, we, do we use it on skin in medicine? Yes, you know, if you have um, you know, an infestation with scabies or something like that, you know, you're going to get something called elamite, which is permethrin cream to put on your body. But, you know, for the most part, we don't like to put it on our skin. Uh, the neurotoxicity of it is real. Uh, but for the clothes, it's probably better to send them somewhere if you really care about it or buy clothes like ex officio. Like these outdoor, like safari ish companies make clothes that are impregnated with the permethrin. They say it's, as I said, for 70 plus washes sometimes, you know. Um, and uh, you, know, you can send clothes to get impregnated. My wife sent a bunch of socks off to my house to get, um, you know, we figured it was a. Okay. I wear them if I'm out, like, you know, breaking. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, the uh, question of uh, uh, checking yourself out, which I do, mm -hmm. uh, what I have is, of course, I've been nailed with several times, behind the knees, groin area, uh, none of the uh, reaction, no, no tiger, no target reaction, yeah. uh, no bruising rash, 
uh, I did treat two years ago. Mm -hmm. But right now, there's, there's, the, there's evidence that something's nailed it. And uh, uh, sometimes it really goes up to the bar. Yes, sir. Under uh, uh, over a quarter of an inch. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, how, what is the stuff that's caused that? What, what's the effect of uh, What has caused that? Is there something from the kick that's still in there? Okay. So it just, as I said, typically those little red, red bumps, what yeah. happens will be just allergic reaction to the tick saline. Okay. It doesn't, because you've been hit by multiple ticks, your body has loaded up a antibody to the saliva, just like some, you know, a mosquito bite would be, and you, you'll react to it in an inflammatory way. If you do, if you've done the treatment like Corday or you have some stuff in the big basil, how long should those bumps stay there? Or they finally disappear. Different people are very different in how long they react to the allergic condition. There's no amount of time. But typically not more than like any other bug bite, you know, mosquito bite, because that shouldn't stick around for more than you know, four or five days. Or four or five weeks. Well then yeah, then I mean that can just be uh, immune your immune response to that is stronger. But if it's still a small, just little red raised bump, I mean, you know, there could be a head in there that you're having inflammatory response to, but I would wait for it to go away rather than cutting it over and getting around. Could I suggest maybe one more quick general question? Yeah. Um, you know, for someone who hasn't had a chance to? Yes. Yeah. Um, allergies to meat and um, throat swelling, how long does that last? So it's different for different people. Um, you know, some people basically, you know, it goes away within a year. Some people are stuck with it for many, many years. You can certainly get another bite, though, and get resensitized. Um, they're able to check levels of the alpha-gal in your system, but it's only relevant to you, you know? So you and then trending you, just because, you know, Bob has an alpha-gal level of five and you have one of two doesn't mean Bob's, you know, twice, two and a half times more reactive than you. It just means that when Bob goes to two and you go to one, you both come down by 50%. Does that make sense? You know? Yeah. So it's, it's, but you can check when you follow with an allergist for this. Okay. What they'll do is they'll see that your levels have come down where, and it's been a while and you, you're like, I really, really want to eat meat. Uh, and they have you, you know, they, they, you, they, what they do is you go and get a sausage patty from McDonald's and eat it and hang out in the office. <laughs> and that's, you know, and they see how, see if you react that day. Whatever, because they, no one wants to eat a hamburger at 6 at 7 a.m. when the office is opening. You know, they're going to watch you for most of the day because it's sometimes six, eight hours later. And you don't want to become anaphylactic at home, you know, so that's how they, uh, that's okay. You know, lots of people hang out for a long time with the allergies. So, um, you're sending us off with great information. I think we're all uh, leaving with uh, comparatively more knowledge than we started with. Can we expect our primary care physicians in Southampton to have a fair bit of knowledge in the same way that we do? In other words, less advice. So, I, I do, as most, to, so the hospital has done lots of outreach programs to try and educate people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, certainly within the Meeting House Medical Conglomerate, which is the hospital's practices, and the younger people who have trained through Southampton recently, right. they're, they're going to be very literate to these things because they've been dealing with this much more. So, and I'm talking you know. about Rebecca, too, as a yes. resource. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, the, there, are, you know, there are definitely people who are faster to just treat, you know? Um, and there have been people who have made brilliant careers out of giving everybody under the sun IV antibiotics for maybe Lyme disease, you know, so you do have to think about that. Lyme is a fear-mongering industry, right, you know, and people don't know what's wrong with them, and they quickly fall down the Lyme, you know, you know spiraling problem, it's, and everything in their life is Lyme, and every problem is Lyme, you know, and as I said, it's important to get a, to just have a good internist, and, a, and to get, if it's a neurologic issue, you can work by a neurologist, not just go to the Lyme doctor, because you know, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. You know? And if, they're, if that's what they do all day is treat Lyme, everything, it's not, it's not even wrong, it's not like they're malicious. They just 
think about Lyme all the time, right? You know, and everything could be Lyme. They really, you know, when you, because it's a very insidious disease. And they see people get better. And antibiotics have anti-inflammatory properties, too. To them, you know, so it doesn't mean the infection got better, you know, or that's why, but you got treated and somehow you felt better afterwards. And then there's all lots of placebo effects. And you know, I can't tell you how many primary care doctors have told me I've, my patient with chronic Lyme, I finally put them on Zoloft and they got better than, you know, they did at, from five, top five infusions for Lyme. Yeah. But in general, just because of the prevalence of Lyme here, the, the, the knowledge base in the community is, is certainly high. It's much higher than most people's doctor in the city, who they go back to who's like, what's that? You know, and now, now they're, you know, it's, it's word is spreading more and more, but I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from, you know, they tend to happen in August, you know, late August when, you know, people have returned to Miami and returned to LA and their fancy doctor who's supposed to know everything calls me up and is like, what's this? And can you help me explain this to them and what they should do and what? Because, you know, if, if you have, you know, hantavirus, chances are the guy in New Mexico knows a lot more about that than I do. And if you, have Lyme disease, I probably know a lot more about that than someone in the area that doesn't have your disease. Well, um, I can't thank you. Yeah. We can't thank yeah. you enough. Well, the, the thing is very that, generous with your time. And, oh, did you have yeah, one other question? So, okay. There yeah. is, the, the hospital has a tick hotline, which you know, they like us to have you guys use, or you know, doctors, we get doctors that from out of you know, the area who call into this all the time. It's 726 tick easy to remember. And there's a nurse there named Rebecca who is very knowledgeable about Lyme, the testing, all these things. And you know, she's done, she's been on NPR talking about it, done newspaper articles and what have you. But she has a lot, she has lots of time to dedicate she to this. I don't know. She could. She could, I'm sure she would. You know, she's very open to things. I mean, she's talked to people in Australia, Japan, you know, all over the world. People call, it's out there. <laughs> you know, I should say Southampton Stonings. Um, you know. Well, okay, so yeah. here's your little present from us at the library. Thank you so much. <laughs>